unrelated question, and I suspect that no one would have an answer, but I'll just ask it anyway. Um, um, you know, in the history of documentary filmmaking, the most important question that filmmakers get asked is the question of ethics, right? But ethics is such an abstract thing, and um, how and where do people know that you know this is the bottom line that we as researchers and uh, or documentary filmmakers sh shouldn't violate? Right? I mean, um, ethics itself is also you know itself also occupies a space for different powers and different conceptions of ethics um, collide, right? So I, I just wonder. You know. Yeah, there are competing systems of ethics, completing competing frameworks. And when you look at the ethics codes, in fact, they're not coherent. Sometimes they're utilitarian ethics. Sometimes they're virtue ethics. But I would say, in general, the virtue ethics has really, really declined as a conceptual framework. So I'm kind of interested in using like Jean-Francois Lutar and some of these people who, postmodernists who were thinking about the Holocaust as sources of rethinking what a virtue ethic might look like. There's other people doing virtue ethic work and it's a positive virtue ethic work. And I've kind of been playing around with whether there can be, whether there can be a virtue which is to recognize that bottom line. And there may be things above that that we can't agree on, but it seems to me to be a virtue to have that minimal capacity to recognize, you know, this is just wrong, this is just wrong. I'm thinking of it as a kind of negative virtue or a negating virtue rather than a productive virtue. Um, virtue ethics, which are common both to Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy, have this idea that the human is a cultivatable being and that the thing to do is to try to lead the human down this path of doing right, so that the human will want to do right. Not because there's an outcome, or they'll get a reward or something like that, but because it's sensed them felt to be the right thing to do. If that is too big, you have all kinds of problems and conflicts. And that's why virtue ethics kind of got pushed away. Humanism had its understanding of virtue, and that kind of fell apart. But I think there might be a space for saying, Maybe it, virtue is a perverse word to use, but negative virtue. But maybe there's a space for saying we have to culti somehow cultivate or recultivate or cause not to be decultivated the sense that there's something basically wrong. And the stuff I presented yesterday is really, really, really clear that from top to bottom, everyone involved in this housing study had a feeling like there was something wrong. But no one could quite figure out a way to go against all of the structures that were pushing the thing forward. And so they dealt with that feeling in a variety of ways. But that feeling seems not to have gone away. There's hysterical research. There's, I've been suggested they write this whole um, article on research ethics in this type of trial. Like you, you know, I don't really like Freud, but you can't, you know, fail to realize that the lady protests too much. It's like a reaction formation. It's like, who asked you, you know, that you needed to produce this entire framework, supposedly new ethical framework. So there's all these pieces of evidence that at every turn along the way, they felt there was something wrong. My colleagues on a parallel team that was working with the community partners just published an essay that's really, really critical of some of the gender dynamics of the project. And they quoted a presentation I made, because I, I couldn't publish this because of my involvement in my research ethics board. And the research team actually attacked their whole essay and my piece in particular. Because that guy, every time I see him in the halls, he's like, you know, there you are. So I'm this like wound that he, every time he sees me, I feel like he knows he did something really bad. But he keeps compensating for any of these ways that don't really address what he did. Like if he just said, well, looking back on that project now, it seems like it was kind of problematic. I think that would satisfy me and the people who 
like was so disbelieving that he could do this thing. So I, I, I guess I kind of have gone back to this very, very, very minimal humanism. That there is some something in our human being that allows us to keep realizing that there's something wrong. And that what we've been doing is blocking that in all sorts of ways. It's not a question of cultivating it, because that produces a language that doesn't quite match that moral recognition. So that's kind of what I'm playing around with these days. If you're training young filmmakers, I think you are in a place where you are <laughs> dealing with that very issue. Because they all, you know, the young people, the young trainees all come back, they're really upset about something. And I think that's the moment when you're like, okay, let's not rationalize that. Let's think about what that means. Maybe for you at this point in time, you can't do that piece of film. Maybe for you at this point in time, you can't do that set of interviews. So I think we, as grown-ups, we have to make it possible for people who've been on a path to step off of that path if they're having a moral crisis on what they're doing. Otherwise, we're just deadening their ability to realize this is not a good situation. Okay, I think, um, thank you all very much for your uh, questions, and then thank you again. Cindy's uh, fantastic talk. Um, we are hoping in the sometime in the future might get her back again. Oh, I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, like we're, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, thank Cindy. You